We try to create experiences for our customers and our consumers. But there are times in our lives where experiences are created for us. Hey, dog. Hey, Elise, how are you? How's it going? You think about the major events in our lives, there's always an amazing food experience tied to it. Good morning. That's what brings people together. And that's where people get to share their beliefs about who they are and what they stand for. There are neighbors, there are friends, different cities, different communities. You know, when we come together, we can make a better world. A whirlwind of a person who's not going to take no for an answer. There was only one greatest generation. And, you know, I admire those guys so much. I was truly amazed at how kind the world could be. These are stories that absolutely have to be told. I think it's something that we really need. It's about what we can do for others. That's powerful. Hey everyone, Jim Snee, back at you another Friday night spent with Hormel Entertainment. Right? Who knew through all of this Hormel would be such a big player in the entertainment business? Um, really glad to have you joining us for the first ever Hormel Film Festival. And really a, a festival that's going to help us celebrate and give us hope. It's going to demonstrate courage, and it's going to tell stories of some pretty unique and uncommon individuals that are part of the Hormel family in, a, in some way, shape, or form. And so you're going to hear stories about team members who have overcome some incredible challenges. You're going to hear stories about fans, inspired fans, who are finding ways to make a difference in their communities, and with others that they're engaged with, and they are making a difference. And the thing that you're going to find across all of these films, across all of these stories, is that these are truly amazing people. And we are so fortunate to have them as part of our Uncommon Company. And this is another chance to just sit back and relax and hopefully unwind and forget about what's happening in this crazy world of ours just for a little while. So we're so glad you're here. Take a second, go get that popcorn made, make sure you put on plenty of butter, and during the last concert I finished my last beer, but I've got a new bottle of wine. So enjoy your popcorn, enjoy your wine, and I know you're going to love the film festival. Holly, Hello, Holly Johnson, everyone. the executive director of the Hormel Historic Home, my right-hand man, partner in crime. What we're doing tonight is we're offering a sensory-friendly activity for those who benefit from a more controlled environment in the chaos of the holidays. And then we do have Mary Barica, who is the face of all of our programming. I think that was the hit of the night. Mary really takes it out to reach the community. I didn't even know what autism was when I first started on this journey. Having a child with autism, the Hormel Historic Home, you know, they came to me and said, are there opportunities for your daughter in the community? And, and there really weren't. Everything was in Minneapolis, or at least 100 miles away. They wanted to come up with some autism programming and outreach, and they approached me, would you be willing to spearhead a project? And I said, absolutely, I would love to do that. And I hung up the phone, and that's kind of how it all started. We started an initiative in 2017 called Autism Friendly Austin. And it's really my priority now to go out into community organizations and businesses to educate them on what autism is and how we can be more welcoming and understanding and supportive to not only customers that may be on the autism spectrum, but employees. So I felt an obligation to share and help other people. Give that a squeeze not only my own needs for my own child and our family, but a lot of families. Certificate of designation, Style Lounge Salon. 
has committed to being autism friendly, sensory sensitive, and family welcoming. All right. Here you go. Thank you. Congratulations, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good, my dear. I was introduced to Sarah by a mutual friend early on in my autism journey. Meg was two, Samuel was three at the time. It was so nice for me to have found someone that I could talk to and that had walked the walk and understood. When Samuel was diagnosed, do you think, I can't do this. I didn't pray for a special needs child. That's for somebody else. <laughs> I am not strong enough for this. And you're in the country, so you're even more isolated. Mary and I have been there together. It's that programming that's kept him on track. Places where they can go and feel like this is my place in the community. We were always looking for jobs for Samuel, and we were kind of stalling out. He does not like manual labor, and he's always loved spam. So Mary Barinka approached the spam museum about becoming an autism-friendly place. She is able to bring to us a certain number of tools that really helps to promote a safe space for people, not just with autism, but with sensory disorders, sensory awareness issues. So we were able to bring Samuel to the museum to help him develop his skills for his future endeavors in the work environment. Hey Samuel, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, Steve? I remember Samuel trying to greet someone at the door or trying to even talk to someone for a minute in the span, a minute. Uh, we, that's where we started. We started with, all right, let's focus on this for a minute. Hello, first time here? Yep. Oh, welcome to the Spam Museum. These are total strangers. And you have to get over your shyness and be warm, embracing, and welcoming while giving them a whole linguistic entrance into the museum with all that they have to see and hear. Have fun and have a spamtastic day. Thank you. Samuel at the Spam Museum, he's the result of a community really coming together. Amy, I love Spam Benson. This is a culmination of many years. It tells you different people are welcome here. So Samuel, you have been a Spam ambassador now for three years. Three years ago where we could hardly get you out to talk to like... people. And you were, you, know, you were a wreck and now here you are leading tours around the museum and having such a comfort level with talking to people and yes. really being who you are. So we have gotten you something, and it just showcases how much we appreciate all that you've done for us. Oh! <laughs> that is awesome! Spaniel! Spaniel shirt! There's so much to be hopeful for and to look forward to, and there's myself and a large community out here waiting to embrace you and make that happen for you and your family. Dear folks at SPAM, I have attached photos of my sweet and awesome little boy, Jackson. Jackson has a superpower and that superpower is called autism. His superpower is so special that he will only eat very super and specific foods. The best of the best is spam and only spam. So, superhero needs his own superhero cake as well. What do you think of that? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack is always a good time for spam. He has now learned to fry it himself because he says he knows how to fry it to perfection. As you can see from the photos, our little 4th of July cookout, where everyone is having burgers except for Jackson, he is grilling his spam single. I just thought I would share this little bit about Jackson and thank you for creating something that my guy will actually eat and loves. I wish you could see and hear him as he watches me put cans of spam 
and the Spam singles into the shopping cart. He yells SPAM almost every time. Anyway, thanks again and keep on making it. A superhero depends on it. I love Spam. Cause it's delicious. was going on at the city. My brother was sleeping at the bed, and there's a big rocket that uh, hit the uh, house. It destroyed half of the building. So, because of the impact, my brother fell from the bed, and that caused really big damage in the inner air. And that's how he became a deaf. Actually, he didn't born uh, as a deaf. We're so lucky that we arrived to the United States. I mean, it's a big dream for everybody. His mom had worked for me before and said, hey, I have a son that I would like you to, to hire and, and uh, give him a try and told me that he was deaf and, and Tung interviewed him. Because he's deaf, he, he can't speak. i kind of like a nervous. But after we walk around uh, on the line, when I try to explain something, he pick up faster than the translator guy. So I feel like he don't need the translator. Everything that we thought would maybe be a challenge, he overachieved that. He was as good as it gets, so. I, I talked to my boss and said, why don't we try that? I was pretty amazed. So we got somebody in here to translate. That's how April came into the picture for us. Being an interpreter and with my education, I know that the only thing deaf people can't do is hear. Most of them, they say, we go out there and we try to find a job. Nobody trusts us. Especially when they haven't had that belief because of the background that they've had. My mindset coming into it, you can do this. Basil worked at a bakery. He was given very tedious jobs. Arafat came over from Yemen. Over there, they're seen as being dumb because they're deaf. And when they started coming in, they were just hungry. They were hungry to be leaders somewhere that they've never been given the opportunity. And Abdullahi he started coming up with different ideas for us how to communicate better. With Abdullahi coming in here to work and looking at him, you know, it's like, okay, deaf people can do this. I'm gonna show you that I can work. I'm gonna show you. I mean, they're some of the best operators we've ever had. His mom gets sick, and he's the only one to take care of his mom. My mom, she's my hero. She sacrificed a lot of things to me, and right now it's my turn to pay her back. I, I want to make my mom proud all the time, all the time. I'm, 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 I'm proud of, I'm the best son. 
He's the most positive, energetic guy that I've ever met, especially with the challenges he's had in his life. So I think his mom is going to actually go back to her own country, is what he's telling me. And when she does, he wants to come back here. When they come in and they tell you they wanted to come here because they heard of the opportunity and they heard that we will give them a chance and that they've never had that before. I mean, one, you're proud of that. On the other, it almost breaks your heart that people don't see people for what they really are. You know, they see them for damaged goods or they don't have the ability because of this, that, or the other thing. And, you know, when you listen to the story that they tell you that they came specifically for that reason, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a very humbling, very proud moment that, you know, and I tell my staff, I mean, that's, that's what we're about. That's what we always need to be about. Um, that'll be the difference between somebody going somewhere else for a job and staying and working for us. Being deaf, being Muslim, you have so many obstacles that you have to face. Jenny O has definitely provided a sense of community in a very broken world. They're in the picnic and they, they wave American flag and I'm almost crying because they're on the same page, you know I mean? Uh, they come here and they know and they appreciate what they got now. Every culture, we must believe they can do it and give them a chance. At other jobs, they just felt kind of defeated and they came here and had new hope. It's, we're all in this together, we're all a team, we're all a family, and this is how it's gonna be. When she first came here and we started working together, I was a little nervous. You know, what have I done? You know, I, I brought on a girl who I, I don't even know, coming from Costa Rica, who lives in Rwanda, who wants to start a peanut butter company, and she doesn't really know anything about the industry, and have I bitten off a little more than I could chew here? And the spirit of today isn't to have Grace perform this flawless, well-rehearsed presentation. We're her rehearsal because someday she may need to present this to people who can really have an impact to help her get her business going. So it's an opportunity for her to share with you what she's learned over the past three months. My idea is that I want to feed people and you're going to understand in a few minutes why do I really want to feed people? <sighs> it was really serendipitous. Me and my family were vacationing in Costa Rica. My wife and I, every morning, would go for a run on the beach. And running the other way is this, is this guy who looks vaguely familiar, but I'm like, that looks like Will Paradise. And we passed the guy and I'm running. I'm like, that's Will Paradise. And Will Paradise is the former president of the Whole Foods Rocky Mountain region. Uh, my host family's house, and this is where I've been staying while doing my internship. So, hi. And so I see Will Paradise running by, who lives in Boulder, and we're in Costa Rica. And then three weeks later, we meet Grace, and she tells us her story, and then she says, well, I <laughs> want to start a peanut butter company. Do you know anybody in peanuts? <laughs> like, well, as a matter of fact, we do. We do know someone. <laughs> So first I'm like, well, let me meet this young lady. So Grace and I set up a, a Skype conversation and immediately I knew she was special. I was born in 1994, which is the year that Rwanda experienced horrible genocide against Tutsi. With my auntie and mother, we were trying to go to Burundi, and my mother, after giving birth, nothing at all to eat, and so she passed away. I was just two days, but I was lucky enough that my auntie was there. She held me and took care of me. Seeing this life that I'm growing up in, I suffered a lot. I've spent days and nights not eating. That's how the passion came to become an agent of change, try to do something that will create a positive impact to my community. 
This is my aunt, my hero. She tells me that I look like my mom, her sister. So anytime she sees me, she remembers her sister. Yeah. I just miss her. <laughs> We've never done an internship that encompasses all departments. And so I knew that if this was going to happen, it had to be me. Because this, to me, this wasn't an academic experiment. You know, this was an opportunity for someone to start a business that can change lives. And so it's like, all right, Grace, we're gonna write a business plan. Your goal and what you'll be evaluated on is creating a plan. And this plan isn't for a grade. This plan is to change your life and to change other people's lives. People and make sure that coming back to Rwanda after that, there's just distractions of everything. And it's just too much anger of what happened. And it's not easy, you know, to see somebody who killed your parents, your family, and be like, yes, I forgive you. And we have to move forward. Thanks to everybody in the house. I don't want to hold this anger, but I want to be a change maker, somebody who could bring a positive impact instead of going back to what happened. You know, when we come together, we can make a better world, regardless of who we are and where we come from. So thank you so much for everybody. I really appreciate. She came here to learn how to make a product, and she's going to leave here knowing how to start a business. To make you official part of our company, and Justin's best. But this makes you an official part. Here, put it on. You're an official member of the Justin's team. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. <laughs> this young lady has every reason to be bitter, to be a little angry, to be a, little, a chip on her shoulder you know, to really want to get back in a world that's been really challenging to her, and she doesn't have any of that in her. She wants to continue to pay it forward and continue to inspire positivity with grace and humility. My mom gave that name before she passed away. I'm so grateful that I have that name, to be honest. I feel like I live by grace, and she keeps telling me, grace will always follow you. We try to create experiences for our customers and our consumers. But there are times in our lives where experiences are created for us. It is just an amazing story. This all started thanks to Gordon, our friend here who is at Safeway. I was reaching up to pull a can of spam off the top shelf, and a voice behind me said, so which branch of the service were you in? We were all in different services, all at different times, but this is the one thing we all have in common. <laughs> yeah, so here we are. <laughs> Speaking of the devil. That Chuck? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good to see Hello, you. Chuck. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. What a grip. Good good. Good. His hands are cold, but yours are nice and warm. Uh, <laughs> Chuck had been a B-17 pilot in World War II and flown several missions, so powerful to see a real hero. <laughs> <laughs> Our missions were eight, nine hours long. Go to Munich, it was 10 hours. It was 40 degrees below zero at 25,000 feet. We didn't have electric suits. And I put my hands right like this, and that's, that's, the, way I, <laughs> that's, the, way, that's the way I kept warm. 
the mission to Schweinfurt, Germany, 60 of our bombers went down. That's 600 young men. That's 600. But tomorrow the sun shines, we fly. And the day after that, and the day after that. There was only one greatest generation. And, you know, I admire those guys so much. Maybe we could open that scram. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody heard us. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know what I want. I oh, look at this. Oh, Chuck special. Chuck special. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Yeah. oh, oh my. I'm a family. Take your toes. Yeah. So, four Chuck specials, four oh, yeah, eighties He's from famous, from see? Yeah. I mean, this is a guy that for his 100th birthday went skydiving. So, living on the edge, right? Uh, we live on the edge through Chuck. <laughs> I used this parachute uh, last month. Okay, that one's gonna work. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I heard you took a jump recently. Yeah. How it was, was that? You know, oh, it's great. Okay, that's gonna I, work. I, it's gonna be an annual affair with me. Oh, all right. If, after I get my 102nd birthday. I'm sure everybody in the air when they got into very difficult things, had some kind of a talisman. They had a rabbit's foot, or they had a picture of their girlfriend, or whatever. And I resorted to the Holy Bible. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That was very comforting. It was my help. That's amazing. The whole United States got behind the war effort, everybody. We were a very cohesive nation. That's the way it was. I think it's something that we really need. You got me through. <laughs> West Virginia is a very proud place in which you don't want to look for outsiders for help. But you go about two miles off the interstate, and that's where you start seeing the poverty. And we don't have a lot of industry here. A lot of that has moved away. West Virginia has a very huge drug crisis right now, the opioids. A lot of folks looking for that out to soften their pain for not being able to provide and to have the life that maybe their parents did. It's just affecting our kids in ways that we've never seen before. There's a load of kids and loads of families that need help, and they need to be fed and loved. West Virginia is really country, and usually country people are really nice. Well, our parents were always telling me to do nice things to people, so I took that lesson to heart. I find that I think about how other people don't have what I have, and there are just a ton of sweet people in the world who say hi to me every day, hug me, say what's up, everything. At first I was thinking about all the other homeless people and the large amount of homeless people in West Virginia. Release comes to me and says, Mom, I want to do something for the homeless. And then I found that there was just as much need in my schools as in the real world. And that just changed my perspective on everything. Hey, dog. Hey, Elise, how are you? Good, how are you? Ready for another day? Oh, yeah. When I was at Pokey Elementary School, Mrs. Stevens told us about this little boy who ate his ramen noodles raw. 
I felt awful. It made me want to cry. I mean, if I could, I would go over there, and every time he wanted ramen noodles, I would cook them because I think about how my grandmother cooks me ramen noodles a lot. It, it kills you, knowing that this child had nothing to eat but raw noodles. So I said, Elise, what do you think about maybe working with some kids? Our backpack program, any child that gets free and reduced lunch, they will send home this backpack. Backpack Buddies usually feeds everyone at the end of the week, but they don't do anything on the holidays. So that's why I decided to do something on the holidays, and Christmas particularly. She wanted them to have a hot meal for Christmas. And she wanted to make sure that these there was food in the cabinets for these children over those 12 days. I had to raise a lot of money. We had to raise at least $5,000. Mom said, how are we gonna get $5,000? And I said, you know what, let's post a video to Facebook. Maybe people will donate there. What's up everybody, my name's Elise. And this Christmas, I want to help kids get a meal. I was holding the phone in one hand and her script in the other hand, and she was reading it. And the outtakes are hilarious. Some of them she would say, good evening. Good evening. Oh, what? You're creepy like. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. We posted to Facebook with the hashtag box to belly challenge. And immediately things started happening. I was truly amazed at how they would donate and help out. I just didn't know how kind the world could be. She went out and did the social media and she raised the money. She selected Hormel Completes meals. She felt like that was the best option for her program. The Hormel Completes are so perfect because the kid can just peel it off. And even if they don't have a microwave or a way to heat it up, they can eat it cold, which some of the kids don't have any choice but to do. So that's why we chose that product. She delivered every single one of them to every single school in our county. Poco Elementary School was one of the most hard. It was just really depressing to go to Poco and hear that there was nearly half the school that needed food. Poco has the highest rate of participation in their backpacks. Melissa meets us at the door and she cried, she cried, it was amazing. She was like, I cannot believe that a little girl, this was her vision, this is what she wanted to do for Christmas. I got emotional because just to see a fifth grader want to do something like that and to help kids that she doesn't know. The pure joy of children at Christmas is one of the most magical parts of the season. But it's the generosity of one child that's creating magic for her parents, teachers, and even strangers during a season that can often be stressful financially, she's helping to lighten the load. She's a pretty incredible fifth grader and she's just inspired me to think more about how I can help my neighbor because that's really to me what this story is about. We would like to make a donation of 1,300 trays of completes in honor of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look at this being a movement, that we are owning our communities. The weak, the ones that are hurting, those are the ones that she tends to take under her wings, the underdog. And don't get me wrong, she's still your typical child. She's still all about Fortnite. She's all about playing outside with her friends. But at the end of the day, Elise is an old soul too, and she has a heart to care and to give to people. And that's what she's done. I mean, there are many people in the world who do this, and I'm just one person. More than one of me could change the whole world. Like, they can do anything. The sky's the limit. I'm Elise Simica, and I am the creator of the Barcelona Challenge. It's always a good time to tell inspiring stories about our team members. We have so many great folks and we all have a story to tell. In circumstances such as this, first of all, it's always good to be in the food business because whether you got an economic up or down, uh, it's, it's good to be able to say that we provide folks with food and nourishment. 
but specifically around headlines that you see today, if I think about anxiety that people might be feeling, when we can see and hear these great stories of folks and what some folks have overcome, uh, the challenges they've overcome, what we're trying to do as a community ourselves and overcoming you know, COVID-19, it's just a great opportunity for us to get together and, and join and share in some really good news. This is why I cry. Nigeria died about two, 25,000 lives lost in one year. The war broke out in 83. The country was not uh, stable. People lost a lot of life. During the war, the life was terrible. I saw a lot of people uh, been killed, and I saw a lot of houses been burned, and the life is very horrible. It was bad, very scary. I thought I will die. That what come to my mind. I thought I will die. Boys were assembled in the bushes because they were being targeted by the Sudanese government. Because if these boys stay here and they grow up, they will join the resistance. So all the parents, they hide their kids so they cannot be killed. My mom was telling me to run into that jungle because there's a lot of trees there. We just where to run where we're going to be safe. So I just lost where my parents go and we just uh, go in a separate direction. I know my cousin is older than me. I just follow him. When he stop, I stop. When he start working, I follow him. So I did not know where I was going or what I was expecting. The Sudan government never retreat. They were pursuing. And then the people decided that there is no other alternative unless these boys will be moved to a safe place like Ethiopia. This is what drive us, as we call old boy, out of the country. You cannot live in a country that there is no justice at all. You cannot live in a country that people have been forced against their will. In 1987, that was the time I left my hometown and then I go east. We were just living with nothing. There's no clothes. We choose, we don't have water, we don't have food, we don't have anything. We walk until we reach the river. The river is full of crocodiles and we have to cross the river. A lot of us died, eaten by crocodiles, some are drawn. If you don't be strong, then we're going to be next. If you don't get killed, then keep going. When I was there in Ethiopia, in a town called Pinyondo, the life was not okay. There was no UN, there was nothing. Then the war broke out again in Ethiopia in 1991. You know, it's kind of confusing where we go. There's a war here, where we going? And there's a war there, where, where we coming? I think that, the, you know, it's the end of life. Because I didn't know where, where I am going. We moved to a Kenya border. The Kenyan government allowed us as a refugee. We moved to Kakuma in 1992. So in 1998, uh, there was a rumor, they say American government was planning to take the boys from here to the United States. So I was accepted by the U.S. government for the resettlement. All the people of the United States, they received us. It was all over the news that there is a young kid coming. 
who was really very excited in, in my life. I never see that the, the, some people are loving other people and welcome them in that kind of way. They give us some money for the rent before we get the job, before we get the document to get a job. I love justice. I love the truth. And I, I feel happy when I saw people doing the right thing. I got interview in Orville on uh, December 16 of 2016. I got a good job, I'm working, and I'm supporting my family here and some family members in Africa. In my home now because I'm comfortable with my family, I got a job. For uh, co-workers or employees who are real or whoever see what happened in the rest of the world. It is important because we are we are the family. We work the same place every day. We work as a team. If we do not bond together, we will not succeed. With our teamwork, I will be here. I will be alive. It's very important you tell somebody this story, it will change his life. And some people come back later and say, thank you. The way I go through, and I make it, why can't you make it? If I make it, you can. You may have difficulties on your life, and I don't know if you don't tell me a story. One of the things that resonates with me when I listen to the stories is just such a great reminder of the bigger picture and the other people in the world that we impact. You know, I would also say with there's just so much negativity, not so much negativity, but, but bad things we're hearing about, whether it's on TV or whether it's through the course of our day at work with all the different hurdles and challenges that we're um, helping our team members jump over. Um, it still can just be a lot of, you know, things that are negative. And so to be able to pivot onto something positive, to think about someone uh, who's doing good in the world or who's uh, in some of the stories, think about people who come from other countries and the, the work they're doing and how we're inspiring their life and their future, you know, in the United States or with their families. Um, I just think it helps us, you know, kind of take a deep breath um, remember that we're just all real people and that there's some amazing um, people both in our communities and our plants that are doing some great things and we get to be a part of it. We just don't always get to hear about it. I was born in Mexico in a small city that's called Leon, Guanajuato. 1989, my dad brings us to the United States. I start working on a, on a taqueria <laughs> as a cashier, and then I had the opportunity to start working for Columbus. I say, this is gonna be just for me for one year, and look at me 22 years later. <laughs> it's really amazing how far Maria has come. When she started with the company, she started on the, at the floor level, worked on the lines, worked her way up uh, from the line to higher responsibilities. She continued growing to the point of being a supervisor. And she got there because of who she is, her, the drive that she has. Six years ago, I, uh, I heard that I had cancer on my left breast. So I had two tumors that needed to be re removed. Everything was so fast. It's like having the biopsy and then having the surgery and then losing a part of your body does really affect your self-confidence. And that's something that you need to gain, because if you don't gain your self-confidence, you can survive. Basically, Columbus was a lifesaver for me, because when I came to work at Columbus, I didn't have to think on the issue that I was going through. I just came to work, I focused on people, production, and then I put my problems on the side. I didn't think about it. When you look at Maria, I see a person that has a lot of strength and courage, 
She was always the same Maria that I've always known at work, but I understand and know that she was going through these hard times, but she wouldn't show it at work. You need to love yourself more than anything and to teach everybody that if you can do it, they can do it. I was born in a town named Marka, close to Mogadishu, the capital city. And then the civil war happened in Somalia in 1991. My dad got killed. That was our signal that we had to, we had to, we had to leave. Uh, my mom and um, I had an older brother and an older sister, and I had two little sisters that were two years and one year old. We had to make our, our way to the refugee camp in Kenya. It's about 500, 500 600 miles away. My two little sisters, they were two and a year old, died on the way there. Life in the camp was, was very harsh. You, you're lucky if you get to eat, you know, once a day. When I was six years old, I stopped going to school because I, you know, I wanted to uh, bring income to my family, uh, and I started shoe shining. 2004 is when we got out of the camp to come to the U.S. When I first came to Wilmer, uh, I didn't have formal education in, in the refugee camps. That was very challenging, not having basic uh, academic background. My, my first job at Genio was a uh, cleanup. I've been in Wilmer now for about a year as a production manager at the Wilmer Avenue plant. I'm a quick learner and, and you know, I work hard and uh, people were willing to give me opportunities. Nice has the knowledge and experience uh, that he's brought to this position. And one of the biggest things also uh, makes him successful is his ability to work with the people. The culture here at the Wilmer Avenue plant is very diverse. Uh, we have five prominent languages and cultures. No matter what uh, culture it is, he's able to cross those lines and work with everybody and does it very well. Anise and I have had conversations with his career goals and I know what they are. He wants to be a plant manager someday and I certainly see him doing that. You know, I tell a lot of the Somali kids and, and that, grow, that are growing up in Wilmer, I tell them about my story and how I got to where I'm at just to, to inspire them. My background in the Ravigi camp and the life that I went through made me tougher. My work ethic, I bring my work ethic from that and the drive and the hunger. If you bring in the hard work and, and, and effort, that can help you get to where you want. Growing up in the refugee camps, that have made me the man I am. I think it's extremely important to show these videos because it's, it just energizes people. It's like a fuel, right? It fuels our passion. It fuels our commitment. It fuels our sense of urgency and desire to you know, keep this machine moving in a positive direction for a bigger purpose than what we maybe have had even before. Um, when, I, when I have the opportunity to talk to our plant managers and, and we had a conversation earlier today to hear the stories that they're sharing about the people at the plant that feel the need to come to work. They make a decision every morning to come to work for a bigger purpose than just themselves. It's, it's about their team, it's about their families, it's about you know, providing food to the American public. That's what it's all about. And, and, and they feel very proud of that and they should. They also know, you know as, you, as you talk about the work that they do every day, they know that people safety, food safety is, is paramount to what we do. And they recognize the need to take those skills that they're learning at the facility back to their home because this is this is not just about staying safe at work it's about staying safe at home as well and i i get the hair on my arms michael standing up when we start talking about things like this because you know i'm, I'm surrounded i was telling the team today i'm looking behind me and i got i got hormel paraphernalia around i'm wearing a, a lloyd's barbecue shirt i got a Osceola Foods cup and the American flag sitting over there. And as we are having conversation, it's really about the purpose that we've got in front of us, the obligation, the privilege 
and I'm so proud of our employees for answering the call, right? They're coming to work every single day and they are just doing a fantastic job and, and they motivate and inspire me. Their actions inspire me and I am so proud of them. And uh, yeah, they're, they're great people. I decided when I was first diagnosed that I was not going to give cancer anything. If, if cancer wanted it, cancer was going to have to take it. My job is to roast peanuts, so I get to smell roasting peanuts all day long. Recently, my family talked me into going and having a colonoscopy done. I had neglected my health over the last few years. And when I woke up from the anesthesia, I found out that I had colon cancer, stage 3A. This isn't something I could just overlook. It was something that had to be dealt with, had to be dealt with soon. I named my cancer, it was Oscar the Grouch. He lived in my trash can. Skippy was fantastic with me right off the start into the whole procedure. They told me to take as much time off as I need. It didn't take me long to figure out what I needed was to be back here. Uh, 24 years of doing this, I was comfortable here. I had my friends, my family are here. Roger, the plant manager, he, he knew my chemo schedule better than I did. He knew my medical treatment. He was involved. Someone like Greg wanted to be here, and, and the days he wasn't here, he felt bad he wasn't, he wasn't pulling his share of the load. They let me come to work because I needed to come to work. I needed Skippy more than Skippy needed me. Me and Greg, we've been working together a long time, so I kind of could kind of read how he was feeling some days when he came in, and but it seemed like every, every day still we had humor though. It seemed like the worse the day was, the more jokes he would crack, and it seemed like it really helped him uh, get through. Yeah, there's a lot of times when people hear cancer and, and they think, well, it never happened to me, or they think, well, that's really bad. And then when someone like Greg, who is well-respected, speaks up and tells everybody, if you do what you can do on the front side, you can avoid going through what I'm going through, and that's been a real good thing for the other team that pursue at Skippy Foods. This is hard for me to do. Uh, I don't want the attention, I don't want the lights, the camera. I want to help one person, hopefully more than one, get treatment, get tested, not have to be here. Anyone that's putting it off because they're too busy at work or too busy with life, don't do that. Trust me, prevention is a lot faster than treatment. Storytelling is a great way for, for all of us to stay connected, especially now that, that we are socially distanced, you know, and, and uh, inspiring stories help us to confirm and reaffirm our purpose and our focus on what truly matters in life. You know, for me, uh, personally, hearing these inspiring stories helps me to reaffirm a deep sense of gratitude with our company, you know, see, for me, seeing our team members helping others gives me a, a lot of energy and also, you know, drives me to help, to help even more, you know, so I truly just can't wait to see uh, our next inspiring story and I hope uh, that everybody is going to enjoy the story as much as I do. The first time right away when told me, oh, you have cancer. The first thing coming to my mind is, you die. That's it, no more. My name is Jose Magaña, Guadalajara, it's Jalisco. I come here, this country, 15 years old better life, better opportunities, that's why I come here. When I'm 18 years old is when I start working for CCPC. In 2004, I started with uh, cancer and uh, I stayed like one year in the hospital. And then when my uncle knows I'm sick, he take me and say, hey, move with me, stay with me. He take me like uh, one son. When I need him, he all the time, 
is right there. I stay in his house for a long time. It's a good family, a good uncle, you know. <laughs> I think uh, the family is the best persons you have in the life. I learned a lot for the cancer. Everybody knows it's something not good, but that changed all my life. I'm a good person before, but I think right now I'm a better person. If I feel, I tell you, like, I love you. Because I live like if it's the light day today. It's like one family and the job. Everybody support me, go to see me in a hospital. I feel like that. If I'm okay, if I'm not sick, if I have a second opportunity, I do everything. If you have a life, nothing is impossible. The company support me because I stay out of the job for one year. When I'm go back to work, my position is still waiting for me. I think it's important to the people know, and maybe the guy see my story, maybe start think, oh, if he, that guy he's go for the right direction, I did it too. Que no se rinda que hay otras oportunidades, que hay más oportunidad. driving down a, a neighborhood street. They saw me and they ran. So I saw which apartment they went in. I went and knocked on the door. And the mom came to the door and she asked me what was wrong. And I just told her I was concerned because the kids ran from me. They hadn't done anything wrong, but they ran from me and I didn't want that. I asked them you know, why they ran. They said they were scared of police. They'd always been taught to be scared of police. Not everyone is going to trust police officers, but if you become more than an officer, if you attend a birthday party, make visits to hospitals, you go to, to weddings and graduations, that's, that's trust that can't be, and those are barriers that just can't be broken. That's trust that's there to stay. I'm not getting my hair wet this time when I slip and slide. Last time I got it wet. Fat Mac, you ready? You like my hair cap? A couple of videos and pictures I posted of some fun, silly time with some kids in the community. Me, you know, slipping and sliding with kids in uniform, or water balloon fighters, playing basketball, throwing a football. That came at a time when there was a really high level of mistrust between police and community members across the United States. And so when people saw the work that I was a part of here, really, I think, built a sense of security with people to know that, hey, not every police officer is a bad person. What people see in me is not just the badge and the uniform and the police car. It's, they, they saw me as just a human being. Y'all know what I say about him? What's that? I say, keep this man this side of him. Maybe this side of Mississippi might be this side of him. <laughs> The areas that I patrol are low income, impoverished, and to be quite frankly, they're poor areas. One of the things I did early on in my career is I would keep an ice chest in the trunk of my police car with cold drinks and keep snacks. Really any kind of snacks these kids really, really appreciate. And to be quite honest, it's some of the food that they'll get the entire day is the food that will come from my hand. It kind of starts the process of building relationships. So if I pull up and I give a kid a juice and some peanut butter crackers, then I've just kind of broke down a barrier of someone that maybe wasn't really sure of my intentions. But let me show you how to do it. Since it's your own cup, mine are starting to melt, but you can do it like this. What if my grandbaby want one? You sharing yours, you ain't getting mine. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> you put food in someone's belly, I mean, you're, it makes me happy. I think it'll make anybody else happy, especially coming from, you know, from a police officer to a child. Can you hoop? This has got more in it. It's an N1. Inspired to know that my heart makes a difference, 
my passion every day uh, gets me up and wants to kind of get me out. On behalf of Skippy Foods, Carmel Foods, I'd like to present you a check for ten thousand dollars. Wow. Were you expecting this? No, not at all. Honestly, I thought I would come here and take a tour, meet some of the employees, and, and then probably go home with some peanut butter. I wasn't expecting anything of this magnitude. The fact that Skippy has enough faith in what we do with the Mission Gift Foundation to get that much money back, uh, it's a huge honor. I'm inspired to know that even though there's a lot of hate across the world today, I'm inspired to know that love can, over, can overcome hate any day. Best thing that happened to me. Keep me out of trouble, you see. I was a number. I was a number. Can you hear me singing this thing? Y'all, y'all can't make that up. Only in North Little Rock, Arkansas, right there. I was sir. Norman. I was a normal. There you go. You the best thing that happened to me. Well, let me start with just saying good evening to everyone. And I hope this note finds all of you and your families and friends healthy and safe. We all know there is this never ending stream or barrage of negative news and media around this COVID pandemic. And we hear it every day, right? The number of positive cases continues to rise, record unemployment numbers, you know, gloom and doom, the slowing of the economy, and the anxiety that comes with that, where we're just all wondering, when do we get back to some sort of sense of normalcy in our, in our lives that we're living? So with all this negative news, you know, it'd be easy to get sucked into this negativity and have a bad attitude. You know, and it may not always feel like we are winning, but I can tell you we are winning. And when we hear that from our customers who tell us that we're performing better than our peers, we hear that from our team members who appreciate our transparency, our empathy, and our commitment to just being the best communicators we can be. So when we hear uh, from our inspired fans and our team members around the company, this just lifts us all up and it reminds us all that there's a lot of good in this world. There's a lot of good things that are happening in our country and in our company. So I would just remind us all that, again, even though it may not feel like we're winning, we are winning. We were built for this and together we're gonna get through it. So I just hope that everyone stays safe. Welcome to Jack and Daddy's workshop. Today we're baking um, Jack's um, favorite um, 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 turkey meatballs. About three or four months ago, my dad was in the hospital. He was going through some issues, and uh, I thought it was important that he start trying to eat a little healthier. So Jack decided he was gonna make something for me to learn how to cook for pops, because everybody in the family knows I can't cook. A fun way that we wanted to give her some recipes was that Jack and I made a video of Jack making these famous meatballs, as he calls them. Add your egg and your turkey right into a big, big, big. My dad's reaction to the video was he absolutely fell in love with it. He had called me and said he had watched it at least 30 or 40 times. But we didn't think anything else of it, and then we found out that my son's mother-in-law sent in the video to Jenny O. It was nothing more than, hey, check out this video of my grandson. He made this great recipe using your product. Just thought you'd like to know. My mother-in-law sent it to Jenny O, and here we are today. 34. There's 34 meatballs, yay! Um, there you have it, Jack's famous meatballs. Right after we made this video, um, shortly after on April 8th, 2018, unfortunately, my, my dad passed away. Um, there were some complications, um, and unfortunately, he didn't make it. 
When he passed, it was very sudden, uh, but my dad was just a great man. His love of his life was his family. Uh, he did everything for his family. Um, he was a fighter. What was Pops like? He was funny, but now he's in heaven. Do you miss him? Yeah. This morning, a camera crew arrived to take video of Jack and Chef Ron making uh, meatballs in our kitchen. Well, what are we doing? What's going on? My first answer was going to be, we're making meatballs, which we did, but we went deeper than that. They all jumped down there. It really has to do with a young boy that celebrates a grandparent. I got to know a very special sous chef this morning. This is Jack. All of us in our work and everything that we do, we're all looking for that larger purpose. You know, well, what, what does all of this work really mean at the end of the day? So to see this very personal connection to a very personal time in the lives of this family and really a difficult season, but this recipe is going to probably live in this family and this story is going to be told for years to come. So he's no longer with us right now, but. He's definitely here with us today in spirit. I know without a doubt, he would think this is absolutely awesome. This little boy made some meatballs and we saw a video of it and it all started with a simple meatball. Oh, Lucy, she came to us like a ball of fire. I'll never forget the first time I met her and how grateful and excited and emotional she was when we had a room open up for her. The Hope Lodge is a home away from home for cancer patients undergoing daily outpatient treatments. When I originally met Lucy, um, she had already undergone multiple surgeries. When she got to the Hope Lodge, her face was very distorted. I had stage three squamous cell carcinoma, and you thought like, you know, it's nothing. I didn't know it was that bad. I had five surgeries, and that all failed since I had 12. I've been here for almost 10 years and I don't think I've ever seen somebody endure the surgeries and the treatments that she's undergone. When I had my radiation, I couldn't swallow anymore. I was on feeding tubes since 2014 and it was really hard and you get so nauseated. I had to fight with your doctor. I need this replace. I can't do this. You had to have nutrition. I said, can you give me a week? If I lose a pound in a week, I will go back to my feeding tube. Like when I had to learn how to eat, the first thing came out in my sight was the Hermel foods while I was staying here. It all started with the protein shake drink. I know for Lucy alone, the Vital Cuisine product has been very helpful. Oh, the drink, that saved my life. <laughs> I gained three pounds the first week. So I started with the liquid of Vital Cuisine, then went into the food. And I was eating that all the way until I was done. When I'm in a lot of pain, if I go to the kitchen and start cooking, the pain goes away. And the rice is done. Her therapy and pain control is cooking. I, I get to have dinner things to eat. I think when you had food, just put it in the table, everyone gathers. And to show their enjoyment, it makes you feel good. 
They're always my guinea pig when I'm here. I call Fred all the time. Yes. She became everybody's friend and family instantaneously. Hi, Fred. How are you? What we do is like paying it forward. You know, if I do something for you, I don't want anything back, but you had to help others. And the way she inspires people to do that through her cooking and her positive energy is amazing. I think of what she's done for my own spirit to see somebody battle through what she's been through. She makes it easier to go home at the end of my day and think, what a great day. She calls it her beautification, and uh, it really is. During this difficult time, it's important for us to use stories to remind us of the challenges that have been overcome and how, by staying diligent, we'll get through this time period too. Stories help us understand others. They help us understand where we've been, and they help us give insight as to where we're going in the future. Stories are a great way to communicate. It's been the way that humans have communicated since the beginning of time. Everybody has a birthday, and so everybody can remember that moment in time uh, where they had a special wish, where they had friends singing happy birthday to them. And who wouldn't want to share that with a child? these kids are coming from situations where they don't know what's going to happen in the next hour. They don't know what they're going to eat. You are addressing a really basic need. There's so much hatred and just bad traumatic things that you see on the news nowadays. It's just like you sit back and you're just like, what does the world come to? You know, like, why is all this bad stuff happening? So it's nice to just really see that there's still kind people in the world that genuinely care about people who may not have what they have. The Birthday Party Project just celebrated our eighth birthday. We started with one agency in Dallas and have grown to 46 parties a month in 15 different cities throughout the United States. So you think the agencies we work with do the hard work, they're providing the basic needs. We get to provide that level of, I'm just a normal kid and this is my birthday. To be able to bring that to a child who needs a little extra joy in their life, um, it's just, it brings communities together. I volunteer for the birthday party project because I wanted to spread joy to children. Growing up, I had a birthday party every year and it was something, honestly, I probably took for granted. I think that the Birthday Party Project is different from other volunteer opportunities in a way that when we walk in, we know that we're trying to put a smile on that kid's face and it's a lot more personal than other opportunities. So today we're at the headquarters for the Birthday Party Project and we've taken our Good Feeds Us All tour to Dallas, Texas to be here. And today we're gonna be um, hosting a birthday party. I think we really fell in love with this idea because for us, the Birthday Party Project lives out really the Brand's purpose around Good Feeds Us All and their purpose really of bringing joy into the world and celebrating kids that maybe are in more transitional areas of their life and Good Feeds Us All is really grounded in this idea that we as a natural food brand are intending to not only bring good food into the world but to bring uh, to light all of the good that's going on in the world too and so that's kind of why Birthday Party Project spoke to us as well as we see all of the good that they're doing.
And my name is Bo Coffrin from lunchboxdad.com. Normally, when I do a demo, it will be on TV or doing a radio interview. Today, I'm most excited, honestly, is to be with these teenagers and to be able to celebrate their birthday with them. And to me, it's it's an honor just to be here, to be able to show them a little bit of something, but also learn from them, too. It's a different thing every time. So it's like, okay, so what are we, what are we gonna do? What is it, you know? What's the activities that we're gonna do? So it's fun to, like, kind of guess it. We bug the staff about it. So when the birthday party project comes in and it's somebody from the outside, it's just like somebody else cares about our birthdays too. So they brought somebody in who actually cares about us and wants to throw us a birthday party. A lot of the kids who come here were thrust into situations where they had to grow up really fast and learn to be adults and learn how to survive. So they come here and they get to celebrate their birthdays. For teens, they just want to be kids. They want to be treated like anybody else. And to see that little kid come out in their face when they're opening their gift, when they're blowing out their candle, that's really special. It's also about strangers coming together and there's something about food that just opens up uh, this idea that you can um, communicate together and it breaks down barriers, breaks down walls because I haven't done anything for my birthday since I was like 16. And now that I have a baby, it's like no one really asked me about me. It's more like, oh, how's the baby doing? So it was nice to just be able to come here to the birthday party project and get a little cake, you know, get some presents. When I hear good feeds us all, it really just, what I get from it, it means that no matter what you're going through in your life, no matter what's happening in the world, as long as you within yourself and the people around you still have kindness in their heart, they try to see the brighter side of everything, you'll be okay. I'm inspired by people that overcome circumstances. On the operations side of the business, we're faced with a lot of adversity and I'm always inspired by people that look at that adversity and those obstacles and say, well, there's a way to work around this. There's a way to get over this. There's a way to get past this. Those are the people that you want to work with, right? Those are the people you want to be around. But one thing that you do get when you watch these inspired stories is you get to see people overcoming barriers, obstacles, circumstances that give us all hope, right? I mean, it gives us that ability to say, okay, you know, yeah, we're going through something, right? We all are. We're all struggling with it. We're all feeling the stress and, and the apprehension and everything that comes with, you know, a change. But, but then you see people that, that were faced with much more, quite frankly, than, than most of us have had to deal with. And, and it's so uplifting to see that they overcome it and do it with such grace and, and do it, quite frankly, without a whole lot of fanfare. The fact that in many cases, we're giving them attention is something they're not comfortable with. And yet, they're heroes when, when you look at what they do and how they do it. Hi, I'm Wilson Tang. Welcome to Nam Wah, Chinatown's first dim sum parlor. So the restaurant opened in 1920. Uh, it was one of the, and it still is, uh, the oldest restaurant in Chinatown. The Choi family sold the business and the real estate to my uncle uh, in 1974. My uncle retired. Um, I'm, I took over about eight years ago and uh, continue to run it as a full service restaurant. I am a native New Yorker. Um, been in the restaurant business for uh, over 10 years and a pretty cool guy. <laughs> it originally started off as uh, a hub for Chinatown, really, uh, back, back in those days. Um, and it was your neighborhood restaurant, it was a place where people gathered. Uh, to hear about news from back home, um, to eat, to, to chat. You know, in my culture, um, forget about anything else, it's like, did you eat yet? Because my parents were immigrants, like, 
you know, there was, they were in survival mode for so long that um, it, it's just kind of drilled into to who I am today and how important food, and it's why I kind of chose to come into the food business. I am what you call a 9-11 survivor. So I, I worked at the World Trade Center um, at, at the time of the 9-11 terror attacks. I, I think the fact that I was a young 20-something year old naive um, kid really kind of saved me. Um, I actually didn't think too much. I was more like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay out of my desk for an extra 20 minutes because I have an opportunity to go all the way down before I go all the way up. And I think that experience really kind of um, changed my outlook in life. So I kind of just quit and I came back and I kind of just opened up a little bake shop um, in, in Chinatown. You know, change is inevitable. And um, for me, um, Personally, I, I will do what I can to kind of slow down the change. I want to kind of pay homage to the past, which I'm doing. Like, I, I always, I often phrase, like, I'm trying to keep a piece of old New York old. But as, as my restaurant and my restaurant group expands, we also are doing things like this, you know, and we're part, I'm, I'm part of the change as well. I'm part of the gentrification as well. But, um, I kind of just tread that very carefully. Um, what's inspiring to me is um, mentoring my team. I feel uh, I get the most inspiration from seeing other people successful. When the governor decided that he was going to close all museums in the state of Minnesota, my first question was, is what am I going to do with my employees? They need to stay employed. And then the second thing I had to ask was, what else can we do for our community? And so we made a couple phone calls, touch base with the United Way found out that they were having some significant issues feeding the senior population that they had who were facing this food insecurity and this home delivery program was born out of that. It was just fantastic. Right now we have about between 12 and 14 restaurants that are delivering 250 meals a day Monday through Friday. So every day those restaurants come to the Spam Museum and they deliver their food and the food is loaded onto those buses along with the Spam Bastards and then they go around town delivering the food door to door to these seniors houses. It really has been an eye opener. As we're practicing social distancing, we set it on their doorstep and knock or ring the doorbell. Now they know our route and what time is pretty consistent when they'll get it. A lot of them are waiting at the door. Just very, very grateful, telling us thank you. Today I had a woman just say, I love seeing your face every day. So grateful for the connection, even though we have to stay our distance. So what we are able to do is help bring meals to those individual restaurants and allow them to stay open, allow them to bring in income for their workers and keep those doors open. For some of them, it has literally meant the difference between staying open and shutting their doors. That's huge. And Hormel Foods for having stepped up to do that has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, being asked to do this has really helped maintain some jobs for us and positions here. Major changes have happened in the hotel industry, but it has been very helpful, so I am grateful for that because I know that it's helping um, not only the business, but personally our employees. It's been a privilege. Pretty humbled in our position to be able to still be working, first of all, and to be able to partner with someone like Hormel for our community, our home, has been uh, an honor. It's humbling. This whole thing has showed me that our community 
does really come together, help one another. Not only do we have Hormo buying meals from our restaurants to help them out, we also have a lot of people that are willing to volunteer to help out their fellow community member. If magic were a good word to describe it, I would use magic. It's just a huge reminder of why Hormel Foods, they make that choice to care first and then make a profit second. Oh boy, if it wasn't Cedar Valley, um, I was in sort of like a dark place. When I started working for Cedar Valley, I just kept telling myself, hey, I can do this, I can actually do this. The folks that work here at Cedar Valley Services range from a variety of physically and mentally challenges, mental health issues, to physical, to a lot of different things, but once you're here, you understand that that label doesn't exist here. It's individuals, it's people, it's about them. Cedar Valley has given their consumers a lot of uh, opportunities. They work with you. They uh, know your challenges. They try to make your day better. I love it. Yeah, I call it uh, my second family. The consumers are like family. There are employees, there are consumers, but they're also friends. They're also people that make Cedar Valley. Their needs come first. Well, when you have a partnership with a hormone company, that gives us those opportunities. That gives us that ability to do that. We work hand in hand with the company, the corporate office. We work with the Hormel Foundation. There's always been support from the CEOs all the way down to their management teams. And they treat us as a partner. But it's work that gives everybody an opportunity at some form to be able to perform those job functions. How important is my job? It's very important. It keeps me motivated. It keeps me active and everything. It just gives me an opportunity to enjoy life. It gives me a purpose to get up in the mornings. Crado. Where are we, Henry? We're in Guatemala. Why are we in Guatemala? The, uh, the goal here and the purpose of, of SPAMI, Project SPAMI, it's not only feeding the kids and, and helping their nutrition, but planting the seeds for the future. Coming to Project SPAMI was important to my family because we adopted our daughter here. 13 years later, we're in Guatemala because of the same company. And when Project Spammy first came out, well, six years ago, Kendra was young and she made a can and she started saving money. And when she turned 13, June 3rd, two weeks ago, and here we are. I was just really happy that we were actually going and going to experience this. So to come to Guatemala with Kendra for both my wife and I, it's been very emotional and somewhat overwhelming because we're driving around the city or even the countryside not knowing if we just drove by one of her siblings. 
it's kind of twofold for us right now. We wanted Kendra to see where she come from and the beauty uh, that this country has to offer, but yet also the struggles that these people go through every day. I wanted to see where I'm from and where I originated, but also I wanted to help people. I wanted to give them something, like spam me. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. I knew we were going to experience new things, new foods, meeting people, and see things that are kind of hard or we don't see in everyday life. But once you really see it like up close and personal, it's, it really hits you. And we also wanted Kendra to, of course, as every parent wants their teenage kids to realize how good they have it in the United States. It's very, uh, very rewarding at this point and it's been very emotional. It feels so awesome to give back, and I don't know why everyone wouldn't want to give back, because it's awesome. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very proud of Kendra. I'm very proud of what she's uh, been able to do and how she reacts with the kids here. Um, I've seen a, a bit of maturity come on. I had an amazing time, once-in-a-lifetime experience. I loved it.